Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today for our distinguished lecture today with Professor Tahira Qutbuddin. My name is Dr. Suad Ali. I'm the founding chair of the ACU Council for Arabic and Islamic Studies. I'm faculty head of Classics and Middle Eastern Studies and associate professor of Middle Eastern Studies and Arabic and Islamic Studies. I'm very happy to see you all again here. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd, I'd like first to begin by introducing our distinguished speaker, Dr. Tahir Qutbuddin. Dr. Tahir Qutbuddin is a, is a professor of uh, Islamic Studies and Arabic Studies at the University of, Sh of Chicago. Um, she is a professor of Arabic Literature and Islamic Studies. Her research focuses on intersections of the literary and the religious and the political and, and in classical Arabic poetry and prose. Her latest monograph in Arabic uh, oration and, and Arabic oration uh, art of the function that was published by Brill University uh, Brill Publishing House 2019 in which she presents a, a comprehensive theory of this uh, preeminent genre in, in its foundational oral uh, uh, period, the seventh and eighth centuries AD, and uh, discusses its uh, continuing influence on uh, contemporary Muslim um, sermons. Earlier, she also published a book on the Fatimid uh, Da'i Mu'ayyad, Shirazi, that came in from Brill also in 2005, and two edition translations of uh, ethical uh, sayings by Prophet Muhammad and Imam Ali, New York University Press in 2013 and 16. Her research articles address topics related to the Quran, exegesis, and, um, and women of the, Fatim the Prophet's family, the Fatimid and, the, and, and she also, uh, the Shia, the doctrine, history, and literature, and uh, in, in Arabic, in India, and Arabic in India as well. Uh, Professor Qutbuddin uh, received her PhD from Harvard University, Harvard University and her master from Harvard University and a Tamhidi Magister from Ain Shams University in Cairo. And uh, at this point, uh, her uh, talk today is titled Piety, Ethics and Politics in the Friday Sermon of Islam. And now, with it, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tahira and Professor Tahira, the floor is yours. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank uh, Arizona State University, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Council for Arabic and Islamic Studies, and the Council's founding chair, Professor Suad Ali, for inviting me to speak at your lecture series as part of ASU's Humanities Week events. Thank you also, Professor Ali, for your kind introduction. I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, see if I can make this work properly. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. yes, very clear. All right, perfect. So in my presentation today, I want to talk about the religious and temporal content of the Friday sermon that is part of the mandatory worship rites of Islam. This is a large and complex topic with diverse dimensions. And today I'll address some of the Friday sermon's main themes and its religio-political nature. In the first and central part of my talk, I speak of the Friday sermon in its earliest iterations. I'll discuss Prophet Muhammad's first Friday sermon, um, a Friday sermon by Imam Ali, and excerpts from sermons by other early Muslim leaders. And I'll highlight their focus on themes of piety and eth ethics and their intersections with political and military themes. In the second shorter section of my lecture, I'll offer a few remarks on echoes of this heritage in Friday sermons of the contemporary Muslim world, 
Um, and I'll also say a few uh, words about how decoding these echoes can help us understand the subtext of speeches by mosque imams and political leaders today. So I plan to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and I look forward to your comments and questions afterward. Um, and before I get to the two sections of my presentation, here are a few quick preliminaries. So the Friday sermon, which is an intrinsic part of Muslim ritual across the globe today, as you know, has a long history rooted in the first Friday sermon delivered by the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, and more broadly in the multifunctional orations of the early Islamic world. Now, oration is the English term I've used to translate the Arabic word khutbah, and khutbah refers in the early period to speeches, sermons, and other forms of public address on a variety of religious, political, military, and other important functions. In modern times, as you know, khutbah refers almost entirely to the Friday sermon, and the Arabic word is khutbah al jumuah But that was not the case in its original iteration. At that time, the Friday sermon was just one of the many types of khutbah declaimed across the Middle East that overlapped with each other in theme, but also had distinct functions. So in that early Islamic world of the seventh and eighth centuries AD, religion, politics, and aesthetics coalesced in the rich art of Arabic oration. The first generations of Muslims and their forebears in the Arabian Peninsula lived in a largely oral realm, and they cultivated the art of the rhythmic spoken word. Their speeches and sermons were exquisite in rhetorical craftsmanship, and they were also the major vehicle of policymaking and persuasion. They were the primary conduit for dissemination of ethical and religious teachings as well. So on the one hand, oration in this period was a fundamental art form. Rather than focusing on painting or sculpture or music, the early Arabians focused their aesthetic talents on eloquent verbal creations. And these comprised some of the most beautiful and powerful expressions in the Arabic canon. Oratory, khataba, together with the Quran and poetry, was foundational in the earliest Arabic literary tradition, and it reigned supreme for more than a century as the preeminent genre of prose. Oration's artistic formulation was also the loom on which the community's movers and shakers wove their religious and political discourse. It was the chief form of public address and had central administrative, social, and devotional functions. It was the primary means of government, the major tool for negotiating authority, and the key vehicle for doctrinal instruction. It roused warriors to battle, it codified legislation on civic and criminal matters, and it raised awareness of the imminence of death and the importance of leading a virtuous life. It called listeners to the new religion and formed part of its ritual worship. In addition to being a vital piece of the Arabic literary landscape, it was thus an essential component of military, political, and spiritual leadership. I've recently published a book, as you heard from Dr. Soad, titled Arabic Oration, Art, and Function. And I'd like to briefly share with you the trajectory of the book, which addresses many dimensions of early Arabic oration, including the Friday sermon. So the bulk of the book examines uh, large aspects of classical Arabic oration its preservation and authenticity, its genres and themes, its structure and style, and its orator audience authority dynamics. The book begins with chapters that discuss the characteristics of early oration with its aesthetics of orality and persuasion. Um, these are followed by chapters that treat its four major types, the Sermon of Pious Council, the Friday and Eid Sermon, the battle oration and the political speech. These are followed by analysis of theological, legislative, and other less common types of oration, as well as the few women's orations recorded by our texts. 
In the final chapter, I've investigated how the legacy of early Arabic oration continues to shape the idiom and concepts of religion and politics across the modern Islamic world. Um, and now to the earliest Friday sermons of Islam. Um, the earliest Friday sermons of Islam concentrate on pious themes and supplication, but they also include religio-political arguments as well as military and administrative instructions. The Prophet Muhammad is for Muslims the foremost guide and in addition to the Quran, which he is believed to have brought from God, his own words are revered by Muslims as the product of divine inspiration. The first Friday Sermon of Islam is said to have been delivered by the Prophet Muhammad in Quba, Q-U-B-A, a hamlet on the outskirts of Medina when he emigrated there from Makkah. The sermon is narrated in a large number of early sources, including Tabari's Tariq, Ibn, Ibn Jawzi's Muntazam, Ibn Kathir's Bidaya wa Nihaya, uh, Suyuti's Muhadarat, and Qurtubi's Tafsir. This is the Prophet, Prophet's Friday sermon at Quba that you see on the slide in the earliest narration of Tabari. I'm gonna take you through it in some detail in a moment. Um, there may have been a second segment of prayer after the text, which is not recorded in um, any of our extant sources, as far as I can determine. If you are interested, you can read more about the fragmentary nature of the early oratorical materials in my Arabic oration book. The most important theme of the Friday sermon, an umbrella theme in Islamic sermons of pious counsel, is consciousness of God. The Arabic word is taqwa. I'd like you to try and remember this word as it will feature heavily in my presentation today. Taqwa expresses a fundamental concept in Islam and it is among the most frequent lexemes of the Quran and of Muhammad's traditions. All Muhammad's sermons are framed in the injunction to taqwa and as we will see, it is the framing theme in his first Friday sermon. So taqwa is often translated imprecisely as fear of God. Muslims understand, I mean, translation, and translation is one of my research passions also, and I think it's really, really important to translate, be careful to get the spirit of the meaning in one's translation. So and on, on a slight tangent here, the word Islam, for example, is often translated as submission to God. And although I think that's correct, that's not incorrect, but I, my own preference is to translate it, the word Islam as commitment to the will of God rather than submission, because commitment in English has a sense of agency that the word submission doesn't. So coming back to the word taqwa, and as I said, it's often translated um, imprecisely, I think, as fear of God. Muslims understand it to mean something much more than simple fear. As with many signifiers that are culture specific, no English word or phrase exactly conveys its full range of implications, but its scope comes close to the English Christian usage of God fearing or the biblical mosaic command in Leviticus 19.2 to be holy. The Hebrew word is kedoshim. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. In Islam, taqwa means desisting from evil deeds, fearing God's retribution for any wrongs you may do, being aware that God sees and knows everything, and indeed, most importantly, and paradoxically, being in awe of God while also taking comfort from his presence at all times. This attitude entails believing in God, being ever conscious of him, and thus always thinking and acting righteously. All these shades come through quite clearly in this sermon. The sermon begins with praise to God and an articulation of the creed of Islam, that there is no God but God, and that Muhammad here, the speaker himself, is the messenger of God. And this opening session, as many of you may know, is called the the Hamid, the Hamd section, Hamd and Salawat section. So I, I read out the sermon, the parts of the sermon to you as I, I, I speak about them. God be praised. Alhamdulillah. 
I praise him and beseech his aid, forgiveness and guidance. I believe in him, I do not disbelieve in him, and I abhor those who disbelieve in him. I bear witness that there is no God but God, one without peer, and that Muhammad is a servant and messenger whom he sent with guidance, radiance and counsel after a period had gone by without messengers, when knowledge had become scarce and people had gone astray, when the age had neared its conclusion, the hour had drawn close and the end had approached. Whoever obeys God and his messenger has been guided. Whoever disobeys them has sinned and gone far astray. Um, immediately following, actually, I, I'm gonna read out just a couple of lines of the Arabic, just to give you a sense of the rhythm and the cadence. I, Assume that several of you may know some Arabic, that several of you may not, but just listen to the rhythm here. Alhamdulillah, Ahmaduhu, Astainuhu, Astaghfiruhu, Astahdi, Wa Uminu Bihi, Wala Akfuruhu, Wa Uadi Man Yakfuru, Wa Ashadan La Ilaha Illa Allah, Wahdahu La Sharikala, Wa Anna Muhammadan Abduhu Wa Rasulu. I'll stop here and I probably won't read much of the Arabic anymore. It's it's beautiful to read. So, um, but I just read out snippets of Arabic going forward. Mostly, I just use the English. All right. Now, immediately following the blessings formula, the body of the sermon begins with an exhortation to taqwa. And you'll see that this section uh, begins with the line, "I counsel you to be conscious of God." Wa usikum bi taqwa Allah. The term and the formula would become omnipresent in early Muslim sermons, and they continue to permeate Muslim sermons today. After the injunction, I counsel you to be conscious of God, Muhammad goes on to say, that is the best counsel a Muslim can give a Muslim. This line offers taqwa as the way to paradise, juxtaposing it with the command to seek the hereafter. And the full line reads, the best counsel a Muslim can give a Muslim is urging him to seek the hereafter and commanding him to be conscious of God. The line after it highlights the aspect of fear, which is explained explicitly as fearing God's retribution for a person's evil deeds. Beware God's retribution of which God himself has warned you. The next line repeats the earlier line, describing taqwa as the best counsel and it reads, there is no better advice nor better recommendation. It also repeats in different words the role of taqwa in obtaining eternal happiness and it says consciousness of God, if you act upon it, heeding and fearing your Lord is the best aid for obtaining what you desire of the hereafter. Muslim sermons frequently quote the Quranic verse in Surah Baqarah, gather your provisions, the best of provisions is piety, taqwa, taqwa. The Prophet's sermon here doesn't quote this verse directly, but the sermon's portrayal of taqwa as being the best means to attain the hereafter echoes the meaning of the Quranic verse. Now, the next section that I have marked as C goes on to explain the benefits of taqwa. And taqwa here segues directly into performance of good deeds and refraining from bad deeds. Um, if someone is righteous in doing the things God has commanded him to do, the things that are between himself and God in public and in private, intending by them only God's pleasure, they will become a memorial for him in this world and a treasure for him after death, at the time when a man is truly in need of the deeds he has set by. As for the things which he has done otherwise, his sins, Yani, he will wish that a great distance divided him from them. God, God warns you of himself, yet he is kind to his servants. I swear by the one who speaks truth and fulfills his pledge, again, this is God, that there is no dispute in this. He, the high and mighty, has said, my word never changes and I never oppress my servants. Now, section C explains the inevitable result of one state, good for good and evil for evil. Section D returns to the explicit instruction to remain conscious of God always, and it does so intensively with no less than five mentions of the word taqwa to head each new um, clause. And I've underlined the conscious of God, the taqwa word, so you can visually see it on the slide. Um, the repetition of the word emphasizes the central message of taqwa. Section C's rec recompense for deeds 
is directly linked to this section D with the subordinating conjunction so. So, remain conscious of God, now and later in private and in public. If someone is conscious of God, God erases his bad deeds and magnifies his reward. If someone is conscious of God, he has attained a great victory. Notice also the parallelism here. I won't have a, a chance to talk about the, you know, the, the aesthetics of, of the sermon, but um, I'd be happy to mention that or talk about that a little bit in the Q&A at the end. Going back to reading the, slide, the, the sermon, consciousness of God protects you from his aversion. It protects you from his punishment. It protects you from his wrath. Consciousness of God makes faces gleam. It pleases the Lord and it raises wrath. I want you to notice also the use of the word protect and the Arabic word is yuqi in uh, this line. Taqwa protects you, yuqi, from his punishment, uh, end quote, which is then the word yuqi is derived also from the same root as taqwa and it plays on the two words. Taqwa, a God-fearing mindset, protects you, yuqi, from God's punishment. The next section that I've marked E um, answers the unasked question, does taqwa mean one should give up the world completely? And the prophet says, no, that's not what is meant by taqwa. He says, seize your share of the world, yani you seize your share of the world, but do not be remiss in tendering God's due. He has taught you his book and laid out for you his path in order to differentiate between those who speak truth and those who are liars. Do good, for God has been good to you. Bear enmity to his enemies and strive truly for God. He has singled you out and named you Muslims. Anyone who perishes does so having seen clear proof, and anyone who lives does so having seen clear proof. Now, the first line of this section, seize your share, but do not be remiss in tendering God's due, echoes the command of the Quran in Surah Qasas, through the blessings that God has granted you, seek the abode of the hereafter, but do not forget to enjoy your share of this world. The final section of the sermon that I've marked F ends with dense allusions to God consciousness rather than explicit mentions of the word. And it enjoins the audience to remember God, to remember his might, his power, to take comfort in God, for God suffices the one who places his trust in him. There is no power save God's. Always remember God and act for what will come after today, after this life. Indeed, if someone is righteous in doing the things that are between himself and God, God suffices him the things that are between him and others. This is so because God ordains things for people. They do not ordain things for him. He rules over them. They do not rule over him. God is the greatest. There is no power save God's. That's the end of the sermon. Now, this sermon, Prophet Muhammad's first Friday sermon, forms a blueprint for the main doctrines of Islam. It also forms the exemplar for one of the Muslim community's defining rites of worship. It sets the standard for the Friday Sermon of Islam in terms of ritual usage, exhorted, exhortative tone, standard structure, pious content, and religio-political themes. We see its echoes in the vast majority of the Friday sermons to come, perhaps most significantly in terms of its pious themes, which focus on directions to be conscious of God and remember him, to obey God and his prophet, to perform good deeds and to prepare for the hereafter. For my book project, I looked through a large volume of Friday and Eid sermons uh, for the chapter on Friday and Eid sermons, I did this, uh, from early Islam. And two main concepts expounded um, are exhortations to consciousness of God, taqwa and good deeds, amal salih, as we have seen in detail in Prophet Muhammad's sermon just now. We also find in these early sermons, copious urgings to repent, encouragement to renounce worldliness and prepare for the hereafter and reminders of the transience of earthly life. All sermons are couched in passionate exhortatory language. The opening praise formula often expands to include motifs of creation and God's oneness and extended praise of Muhammad. 
The supplications of the ending segment typically comprise prayers for the well-being of the preacher, the audience, and the Muslim community at large, and a petition for forgiveness of sins. Frequently, they also include specialized appeals, such as prayers for God's aid, a pious life, and a happy death. In some, most sermons include guidance on how to live a god godly life following the precepts of the Quran, especially injunctions to consciousness of God. Now, in addition to Prophet Muhammad's sermons, the sermons of Imam Ali are held up as the gold standard for brilliant eloquence and sage advice. Ali, as you know, is the first Shia Imam and the fourth Sunni rightly guided Caliph. Many of the sermon themes that I've just mentioned are found in a Friday sermon Ali delivered just after the Battle of the Camel in the year 656 in Kufa. And the sermon is cited in several early sources, uh, including Minqari's Waqa'at Siffin, Thaqafi's Qarat, Sharif Radhi's Nahjul Walaqa, Kulaini's Kafi, Yaqubi's Tariq, Zamakhshari's Rabi' al Abrar, and Idris Imad al Din's Uyun al Akbar. It's presented as uh, a, one complete te text, a single text, with an opening tahmid and ending supplications. Now, this is the sermon that, that you see on the slide in the earliest narration of Minqari. Uh, Minqari tells us that Ali had preached the same sermon earlier in Medina. And what I infer from this is that the text contains Ali's standard Friday themes and his preferred imagery and vocabulary, which he used weekly with some modifications. Reiterating certain past themes and associated vocabulary and formulae in one's Friday sermon may in fact, I think, be common practice uh, from this time at least. I'll give you a moment to look at the sermon and um, I won't read out the whole thing. I, I just talk about it and I'll give you just a second to look at it. All right, so I want you to notice that immediately following the praise and blessings formula that I've marked as A, uh, section B begins with the injunction to taqwa, and it uses the same formula that Prof. Muhammad had used to open his address. I counsel you to be conscious of God. Um, I've underlined the lines that I'm speaking of. Ali also, like the prophet, characterizes taqwa as the best counsel God's servants can give each other, closest to obtaining God's pleasure and the best in terms of outcome in all things before God. The next line urges the performance of good deeds and fear of retribution for evil deeds. Again, it, this follows the thematic precedent of the prophet's sermon. I, I do want you to notice the continuity of themes and even in fact, formulate themselves from, you know, the Prophet Muhammad sermon, which sets the precedent for everything to come. So Ali says, you've been commanded to be conscious of God, and you've been created to do good deeds and obey him. Beware God's retribution, which God himself has warned you of, for he has warned of a strong retribution. Fear God without falling short in your actions. Now, the next section, Mark C, expands the injunction to good deeds and highlights their God-given reward. The section after that, marked D, warns of God's retribution for um, evil deeds, and it warns of worldliness and urges the audience to prioritize the hereafter. The final section, E, ends in prayer. Um, I want to step back for a moment and say, uh, point, point out this, which is that you may have noticed quite a bit of repetition, keywords and points in both Muhammad's and Ali's sermons. And I've pointed out some repetitions in the text earlier in the Prophet's sermon. Now, re repetition is an important mnemonic device. Mnemonic, uh, M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C. Um, this means a, a, you know, a memory aiding device, a rhetorical technique that oral societies use to help the audience retain the text's language and preserve its meaning. And there are several of those like, like rhythm and you know, pulsating rhythm, graphic imagery, and so on. Repetition is also a key mnemonic device. Um, orality scholars have written much about this uh, for the oral text of the Hebrew Bible, for example. Susan Nidditch explains that repetition serves to unify the work and to reiterate essential mes messages or themes that the author wishes to emphasize. Um, 
I've discussed aesthetics of orality at some length in my Arabic oration book. In our two sermons that we've just read here, repetition of the words taqwa and good deeds and their surrounding sub-themes emphasizes the central message, the essential message of the sermons. Um, I also want to say a few words about the wide compass of taqwa in early Islamic preaching. So in our two sermons here, the injunctions were very broad. The injunctions were to be mindful of God and do good to prioritize the hereafter. I've analyzed elsewhere another sermon by Ali that explains piety with a very granular description of specific behaviors and traits. And I've shown how he connects taqwa directly with humanitarian ethics. Ali presents virtue and piety as two indivisible sides of the same coin. Just as virtue is incomplete without piety, piety is incomplete without virtue. The sermon begins with a general statement, the pious in this world are people of virtue. Pious and the word is used as the people of taqwa. I'm just going to flash these slides by you to give you an idea of the sermon's broad-based presentation of taqwa. Uh, the sermon goes on to give an intertwined list of ethical and religious traits. The pious are deeply conscious of God's greatness and bounties and do not care for the world. They are kind to their fellow humans for they forgive those who oppress them, give to those who refuse them, show compassion to those who shun them, and so on. In some, according to um, Ali, taqwa governs the totality of a believer's life and it grounds her relationship with God and encompasses her relationship with all of God's creations. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Here's, um, am, I coming, am I coming through? I'm, yeah, everything's okay? Can you? Could you please mute yourself? Um, we have a sound coming from, uh, please mute yourself. We will open it up for your discussion after the end of Professor Kutbuddin's lecture. Thank you. All right, and can everyone hear me well and see me okay? Yes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the, the screens are coming through okay also? Very, very well, yes. Everything is clear, thank you, Dr. All right, perfect, all right. So here's another dimension of Ali's philosophy of taqwa, which advocates living with joy in this world, yet preparing all the while for the hereafter. And he says this, um, I read it out for you. The pious, the people of taqwa, partake of the joys of this world and those of the next. They share the world with the worldly, but the worldly do not share the hereafter with them. In this world, they reside in the most splendid of residences and consume the finest of delicacies. They possess the sumptuous, sumptuous comforts of the wealthy and partake of the lavish luxuries of the mighty. Yet, when they depart, they leave with full provisions and a large profit. I've also written about this sermon in some detail in an article that I've titled Ali's Contemplations on This World and the Hereafter. And for any one of you who's interested, you're welcome to download these articles from my um, academia.edu webpage. Now, before moving on to the Friday sermon's political themes, I want to share with you quickly some excerpts, excerpts from sermons by Umayyad caliphs and governors. Uh, here is a Friday sermon by the Umayyad governor Hajjaj in Kufa. And I'll give you a moment to take a look. In the interest of time, I won't read out everything. So when, even if you don't read the whole thing, I just want you to get a sense of, of what it's about, yeah? Now, the next one is, a, is a, an excerpt from an Eid sermon by the Umayyad. No worry, you have up to the talk. Hmm? You have up to seven o'clock. All right, all right. Okay, Next. thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, this is a, an excerpt from an Eid sermon by Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, also an Umayyad Caliph, and he exhorts charity and giving to the poor. And I'll give you also a moment to take a look. Now, except for this Omar, the historical narrative presents Umayyad rulers as generally impious. 
And if the characterization is, is correct, it would indicate that the pious council offered in the fairly large number of Friday sermons attributed to them was dictated by convention. The Odishiri poet Kumait criticized the Umayyads for preaching piety from the pulpit, while in their own lives they, and I quote him, partook of forbidden food and drink, unquote. Among Umayyad governors, Hajjaj, whose sermon we just saw, is derided by his contemporary Ibn Abi Burta, who's a prominent Sunni scholar, for, he's derided, uh, for making pious speeches while acting in a, quote, pharaonically tyrannical vein. Also, the famous pro-Umayyad pro preacher Hassan al-Basri, who advocated asceticism, also criticizes Hajjaj for hypocrisy, and he says, do you not wonder at this debauched man? He climbs the steps of the pulpit and speaks the words of prophets, then comes down and assaults people with the assaults of tyrants. Hassan Basri was in turn censured for impious behavior by Marwan ibn Muhallab, who calls him the errant show of Shaykh. Now, according to our sources, some early orators were pious and others were quite the opposite. Regardless, most of their public addresses promoted themes of piety. It would appear that early Islamic society expected orators to underpin oration with religious themes. Uh, most orations in nascent Islam were religio-political. All types of orations in the seventh and eighth centuries, including battle and political speeches, contain religious themes. On the other hand, Friday sermons, which focused on devotional themes, frequently also had a political and military side to them. And I've mentioned this at the outset of my talk. In the texts from this period, we see religious advice assimilating with the evolving political aims of the nascent Islamic state. Political themes of the Friday sermon include administrative and fiscal policies and their justifications, executive commands, statements asserting the legitimacy of various power groups and instructions to the subject populace primarily regarding obedience to the leadership. In a classic combination of administrative and spiritual themes, the second Sunni Caliph, Omar ibn al-Khattab, said in a Friday sermon, by God, I do not send governors to flay your skin or to seize your wealth. I send them to you so they may teach you your religion. Now, military themes are also observable in sermons in the form of exhortations to fight in the path of God and to defend the community. A famous oration full of military themes that Ali delivered when his enemies raided a town in Iraq is flagged by one source as a Friday sermon. So most sources don't say it's a Friday sermon. They just give the sermon in the context of, you know, politics and military stuff. But it's flagged somewhere as a Friday sermon. So it's interesting to see, you know, the... the uh, the, the, that the mix of, of themes is, it, it, it makes it kind of complicated in terms of identifying, sometimes identifying texts as the context of, you know, or, or classifying them as, you know, is this a Friday sermon or is this a battle oration and so on. Um, often you can tell, sometimes you can't. Point is, there are, there's a mix of, you know, all kinds of themes in most sermons of this time. So sermons in the Umayyad period often contained actually threats. This is true mostly of the Umayyad period and not before. And these threats are both overt and implicit for non-compliance. This is a Friday sermon, yeah? The Umayyad governor Utba ibn Abi Sufyan preached a Friday sermon in Makkah during the Hajj season. And this was at the beginning of that dynasty's accession to the caliphate, not long after Ali's death and his son Hassan's abdication. And the residents of Mecca and, and Medina and the Hijaz had no love for their new masters. Utbah used the pulpit to threaten any would-be rebels in the following very strong language. I'll read out just a, a few lines from it. O oh people, we have taken charge of this sacred place, Makkah and the Haram, in which rewards are multi multiplied for those who do good as are sins for those who transgress. All right, so far, no, no overt threats yet, but it's coming. And if you see these lines too, in, what, in the light of what comes after, they also sound quite ominous. So do not stretch your necks toward another, lest they be cut off. Many a person who makes a wish finds death. All right, now this is, I'm, I'm just showing you one, this, this kind of threat, threatening language is kind of through, found throughout Umayyad sermons. It's not an anomaly. And I've 
discussed many texts and so on in, in the book, but I think one serves as an example here. Also, the Friday sermon contains usually blessings and curses. And these two could serve a political purpose. So from Umayyad times, it became common practice to include a prayer for the well-being of the caliph. And this evolved into an important indicator of political allegiance. Uh, the practice is reported in a nascent stage earlier with Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ali's governor in Basra, habitually ending his sermons with the words, God help Ali to establish the truth. Now, a little over a hundred years later in an example for, from early Abbasid times, a Bedouin who had been appointed deputy by the governor Ja'far ibn Sulaiman delivered the following pithy short Friday sermon in his provincial settlement. And he preached piety and he followed it with a prayer for the caliph and the governor. And I'll read out the last few lines that I've underlined here as well. I say these words and seek forgiveness from God for me and for you. By the way, this line that I just read out is also a formulaic ending for the Friday sermon that is very early and that becomes quite common and, and uh, later on. Um, the one for whom prayers are offered is the caliph, who's Mansur, then the governor, Jaffa. And then he ends by saying, stand up for your ritual prayer. May God bless you with his grace. Um, earlier in the Umayyad period, preachers had been also required by the Umayyad caliphs to curse Ali and his family from the pulpit. And in the following centuries, cursing enemies of the state became a per periodically recurring feature. I want to go back for a moment, moment to the Prophet's first Friday sermon at Quba. Now, throughout the text, we see the religious authority wielded by Muhammad, where he characterizes himself as God's messenger, and he commands his followers to put piety and virtue. The very fact that he has, you know, he contains the authority in that, that like space to command his followers indicates the high authority that he wields. But in terms of language, note also particularly the political implications at the end of section A, for example, where obedience to God and his messenger is in, enjoined. Um, and I've underlined the words, the lines there. And note also the military implications in the middle of section E, where Muslims are directed to take God's and Muhammad's enemies as their own enemies. Now that um, brings me to the second and final section of my lecture, namely echoes of the early Islamic heritage in Friday sermons of the contemporary Muslim world. I want to emphasize that taqwa-based themes of piety and virtue continue to permeate the Friday sermon in our present day. One of my graduate sermons is actually writing her PhD dissertation on taqwa themes in present-day Egyptian preaching. Um, but I'll not go into that aspect in my own lecture today. Rather, I want to use the last few minutes of my allotted time to speak about broad areas of influence of the classical Arabic oration on present day Friday sermons. And for specific examples and more detailed analysis, I refer you to the chapter on contemporary Muslim sermons in my book, in my Arabic oration book. I've also, uh, by the way, provided links there to many of the contemporary sermons that I've analyzed and you can find many more as you may be aware online as well. And also, by the way, that chapter is based on print and online materials, as well as visits over several years to Egypt, Iraq, India, and Turkey. Uh, these are four countries with large Muslim populations, as you know, and they represent diverse languages, faith, denominations, and political systems. Additionally, I also have offered brief remarks in that chapter on seven other countries. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Lebanon, Syria, Tunisia, Nigeria, and Senegal, and there are many more. I mean, of course, this was a sample to give you a broad, to give in the book a broad uh, perspective. All right, now areas of influence on the contemporary Muslim Friday sermon from the classical Arabic oration include the following, and if you want to follow along on the slide um, in front of you. So the first is the ritual of the Friday sermon itself, the frequent use of the pulpit, focus on classical Arabic as the register of language. Uh, another key area of influence is seen in the use of religious formulae to open and end, including verbatim recitation of what is considered the Prophet Muhammad standard praise formula, Tahmid. And we saw um, a, a snapshot of that in the, the Friday sermon that I read out to you uh, earlier, uh, Muhammad's first Friday sermon earlier. 
The classical structure is also echoed and it includes blessings, the phrase, and now to the matter at hand of Mabad, the vocative address, O oh, Muslims, O oh, people, O oh, people of Iraq, and so on, the main body of the oration and ending formulae of prayer. Another echo is the contemporary khutbah's exhortations to piety using specific terms, especially taqwa, and particularly uh, themes also of doctrine and history and ethics that are continuous from earlier times. Yet another continuity is the inclusion of explicit or implicit political messages. Another is Quran and Hadith citation, sometimes also poetry and proverbs. And finally, like the early khutbah, we see occasional ritual use of a staff or a ceremonial sword uh, in modern times. In modern, not so much in modern times, but it's, we still see that, according to my research, that the preacher leans on in order to demonstrate authority. And even sometimes somewhat anomal anomalously, the ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, for example, in the Nuri Mosque in Mosul in June 2014, when he announced his caliphate, a pretty militant caliphate in the first Friday sermon, in his first Friday sermon, he carried a machine gun, right, which harks back to a weapon. The contemporary sermon also diverges from the classical oration in many ways. So for example, there's minimal stylistic influence vis-a-vis -vis many features of orality especially rhythm and use of parallelism and rhyme outside the opening formula is quite limited. Plus there's very little graphic imagery. Another point of divergence is that in areas where Arabic is the spoken language of the people, a mixed register of classical standard and colloquial Arabic is used. In places where Arabic is not the spoken language, either a bilingual register is used with the formula in classical Arabic and the body of the sermon in local languages. And this is the case in present day Turkey. Or the sermon is in classical Arabic, it's purely liturgical and it's usually accompanied by a lecture in the local language as in India. So local, like local language could be, you know, whatever Tamil or Urdu or depending on where you are in India. Um, in the US today, um, Friday sermons are usually in English. Now we can use the map of classical Arabic oration to decode heritage aspects of contemporary pu Muslim public address. We can use it to see what it means politically when present day preachers use certain formulae or chants or lines from the classical oration. When we know the codes, the conventional blocks, we get the message more accurately. We can distinguish expressions that are formulaic from real messages. We can also see where the speaker is tweaking traditional formulae to serve his agenda. Since modern speeches and sermons are rooted in the traditional canon, some of the most effective keys to unlocking nuances of meaning are found in the conventions of early oration. And here are some examples, and this is my last slide. So we can usually ascertain denominational affiliation by looking at language used in opening and ending formulae. Individuals named in the Salawat blessings formula alongside the prophet, for example, indicate denominational background. Also inclusion in the opening tahmid, the praise formula of the so-called heresy hadith, which goes something like every innovation is a heresy and every heresy is, is in the fire and so on. And this inclusion usually indicates a Salafist outlook. In India, it signals a purist Deobandi outlook versus a more inclusive Barelvi outlook. And Deobandi and Barelvi are two main approaches of Sunni Islam in the Indian subcontinent today. Also preachers use coded historical references. In Egypt, for example, I found that anti-establishment militarist preachers talk about the expulsion of the Jewish tribe of Nadir from Medina to threaten Israel. So they don't directly kind of formulate a threat, but the, it's, it's coded. Uh, they talk, reference the accession of the first Sunni Caliph Abu Bakr to attack the Shia. Again, not always. But in a certain context, it's obvious that there, that's, what, that, that's the point of it. It's not just a simple historical reference. Um, 
Also, to legitimize religious political goals, some preachers, and ISIS preachers in particular, echo the language of orations from the early Islamic period, and they sometimes even incorporate parts verbatim. And a very interesting example that I found is, is Abu Bakr Baghdadi, again, the self-styled ISIS caliph, who included lines from the accession speech of his namesake, the first Sunni caliph, Abu Bakr. And he didn't name him, and he didn't say that he was quoting him. But in the point in his speech where he announced his caliphate, he announced it by saying, I have become your leader, but I am not the best of you. And presumably many in the audience would get the reference. Another example is an extended description by, again, an ISIS preacher in Ramadi of the Shia as a spotted snake, quote unquote. This was a very scary sermon to, to, to watch. <laughs> so be warned if you do watch it, it was, all right. Um, I'm glad I wasn't there. So he ex ex he described the Shia as a spotted snake stretching out across Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and that had uh, a, and 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 he imitated the, imitated the Umayyad governor Hajjaj's metaphor, and he said the snake has laid eggs and hatched offspring, Bada and Farrakh, Bada or Farrakh, in countries far and wide. Uh, the preacher's name also, if, you, if you're if you interested, is Abdul Munaim al-Badrani and his Khat Khutba is on YouTube. Um, hundreds of thousands of people kind of, you know, um, as I said, it was scary. All right. More than other groups whose orations I've examined, ISIS echoes stylistic features of classical oratory, including repetition and nature imagery to persuade their audience to violent confrontation. And moreover, militarist sermons are almost always in full classical Arabic, while colloquial interjections are more common in pro-establishment preachers, such as 12 sermons in Iraq and Lebanon. But this is not always the case. So classical Arabic is also used in India and in other non-Arabic speaking countries because the sermons are mostly recited as a prayer. So people don't understand, most of the people don't understand the meaning. They get the context and certain words and so on. And but the, the the sermon itself is recited and it's sort of chanted often as a, a, a prayer, and the use of classical Arabic there does not automatically signal a militarist mindset. Most often, it's not. And finally, audiences of contemporary Muslim sermons often respond with collective chants, and they mean these chants mean different things in different settings. So the expression "God is great," "Allahu Akbar," for example, signals simple devotion when chanted during the Eid prayer. But it expresses militancy if chanted at rallies of political opposition, as was done in the ISIS Ramadi sermon I just mentioned. And that brings me to the end of my talk. As we've seen, the major focus of the Friday Sermon of Islam, as exemplified in the first Friday Sermon of the Prophet Muhammad at Quba, and Imam Ali's Friday sermon in Kufa is on taqwa, on piety and virtue. And it also enfolds political and military dimensions. Contemporary Muslim societies engage with a host of elements, political, social, economic, military, religious, technological, linguistic, and literary elements that are far removed from the seventh and eighth centuries. Nevertheless, the continuities are no less significant Present-day Muslims look to their Islamic and Arabic heritage to guide them. The scriptural legacy of the Quran, the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, and additionally for the Shia especially, the sayings of Ali and the Imams continue to inspire. The ritual Friday sermon continues to be a major part of the lives of millions of Muslims globally, and is frequently broadcast on airwaves and in cyberspace. Present-day orators of various religious and political stripes continue to draw on themes of piety, ethics, and politics developed in the early Islamic world. The contemporary Friday sermon continues to be powerfully influenced by the content and ritual of classical Arabic oration. And now, what I want to end with is, is this. So we have all these options, right? We have these themes of piety. We have these themes of ethics and virtue. Um, and preachers can use, I mean, those embody the best of the best. And it behooves preachers to kind of, I mean, we can choose, preachers can choose which themes and which points they wish, wish to emphasize. Um, 
and which exemplars they wish to em emphasize. And it behooves everyone, I think. I'd like to, you know, I, I'd like, I, I think it's important to make our historical studies relevant to what we are today and what we do today. And it's important to, to be aware of the various options that we have and then to make use of the best options um, and to promote a, 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 a world with brotherhood and peace and, and taqwa um, among all. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be very happy to take your questions and, and hear your thoughts and opinions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Tahira Khutbuddin, for this wonderful in-depth presentation and lecture about this very, very important topic about piety, ethics, and politics in the Friday sermon um, in Islam and um, going through all of the, you know, earlier and first sermons by the Prophet, by Ali, and uh, all of the subsequent um, sermons coming up to the current time where everything has been distorted. And um, now I'd like to open it up for questions. And, and before that, I just want to, you know, comment on the, the very sad, you know, situation in countries such as the Sudan, where the Islamists and those who use you know, political Islam to further their agenda, and where all of the Friday sermons are directed against their enemies, against the people, against the women, against, you know, and, and uh, even their laws were derived to, you know, to oppress minorities. And, and as you mentioned, um, in Egypt, for example, attacking Jews or attacking Christians, as well as those who, you know, in other areas where they address it towards their enemies. And, uh, you know, in some of the sermons that I hear in Sudan, for example, today, you know, there is no Islam in what they're saying. It's completely political. It's completely far removed from religion. And it's, um, it is very sad indeed. So I don't know if you would like to, to um, comment on that a little bit, Dr. Tahira, before we open it up for, for the audience. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so I haven't looked at Sudan myself. I, I've never been there. Um, you're much more of an expert on that area than I am. So I, I won't comment on the issues in the Sudan particularly, but I do agree with you that, you know, the pulpit is a powerful um, force and that it's really important for preachers to, you know, follow, exemplars like the Prophet Muhammad, like Imam Ali, and to preach the doctrines of Islam, which are taqwa and, and piety and virtue and good deeds and preparation for the hereafter and kindness and compassion and all of these things, right? As the Prophet Muhammad has said, you know, the whole world is our God's children. All people are God's children. And God loves him or her most who helps his children. Um, it's a sad state that, you know, the, the pulpit is used for certain kinds of politics. I don't think it's a bad thing that it's used for politics. And we see that it's used for politics and military uh, issues and so on, right from the get-go, from the very first um, sermon given by the prophet. And it's also, it's not the case that everything was wonderful earlier and now everything is terrible, right? So there were good exemplars earlier and not such good examples, exemplars earlier. And that's also true, I think, of modern day uh, preaching where there are some wonderful preachers and others which are actually just, I mean, they're using the name of religion to further their political agenda versus, um, you know, using, politics as a way to serve religion or, or the spirit of Islam and goodness and you know, bringing people together. So yeah, it's a point well taken. Thank you very much indeed. At this point, I'd like to open it up for the audience. If you have a question or a comment, please unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. I have a question here. Go ahead. Can you say your name and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, 
فراج حمدان Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tahar Qutbuddin, for this rich and amazing lecture. Uh, you gave like um, enough uh, definition for the taqwa today, but I'm still there. I'm trying to know exactly uh, which one is maybe very close to the taqwa uh, concept: the fear of God or the obedience to, to God, al-khawf min Allah or iltizam al ta'a Which one is, is more close to the taqwa? Yeah. So all of those are parts of taqwa, right? I mean, obedience, do you have a different word for but specifically obedience, which is a ta'a? Ah. So I wouldn't use, in translating, I wouldn't use obedience because that's ta'a. That, that's, that's ta'a, ta but you, I would like to use a word which encompasses all of these aspects, right? And so I use my, my pre preferred, most preferred uh, word, actually three words, is consciousness of God or God consciousness, because that encompasses everything. Taqwa is like you, uh, if you're aware of God watching or being there, pres present, then that, you know, then you all of the, everything, the obedience, the good deeds, the God-fearingness, all of those things come from it. Um, I actually also want to say that, you know, it just depends on the context. So depend if I'm translating, and I've, as I, you know, mentioned briefly, I've done several trans, you know, book-length translations of hadith and, and so on, and I'm actually working on a, just finished a translation of the Lahjul Balaqa, compilation of Imam Ali, which also has, I mean, so taqwa is everywhere um, in these in these, in these these sermons, and how do you translate them? So I, I, I don't stick only to consciousness of God. So depending on the format, if it says, ittaqullah, for example, I would say, be conscious of God, yeah. rather than practice, you know, but, or, and sometimes depending on, you know, the, the in translation, you need to be aware uh, of, of balance, and, you know, the length of of, of sentences and so on, those are also aesthetic considerations in terms of being effective. So sometimes I use piety instead of consciousness of God. Um, I think that also kind of nicely encompasses, if there is a sense, if the word is used in a sense of God-fearingness, then I use God-fearing. Fear, God I don't like fear God so much, except when it's explicitly in that sense. In, in that sense. But I think God-fearing comes close to also to 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 this to this one. Do you have any suggestions, Dr. Faraj, or further uh, suggestions? I uh, no, I'm not sure with this one. I'm just like uh, I don't found like that fear of God is is it is the taqwa because yeah. in this part we are thinking about the God is merciful so mm -hmm. and yeah and people also is free. Uh, to choose to do everything so mm -hmm. the fear here is for me this is like personal thought yeah. i found that maybe the obedience it's, it's maybe more close to the to the taqwa uh, like uh, in arabic iltizam ta'atullah wa ijtinab yani ijtinab ma haram for example so maybe this one for me at, at least this makes sense yeah yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Farash Hamdan is our instructor for Arabic studies. Um, he also did his master's at, uh, at, at the ASU and he did his PhD at the University of, of, of Arizona uh, in Tucson. Oh. Thank you, his teaching for us this semester. As, as um, he's originally from Iraq, by the way. Um, and, and, you know, the, the discussion on Taqwa is interesting. Like, for example, you know, like uh, Dr. Tahir said, uh, the context, you know, it, it depends on the context that, for example, you know, in that hadith, uh, there is no, you know, uh, preference uh, for, for of an Arab over a non-Arab, except for most of the translations come as righteousness. And you know, in, in the context of women as well. And so Na'mad um, Barazanji was criticized very severely when she used 
the word equilibrium for taqwa in one of her books. So, and I, I was the one, you know, I was among those who criticized that because it, it, it didn't fit, you know, in that in the context she was using it. But, you know, she didn't ex explain it ahead of time in her book. So, you know, it's, it depends on the context. So let's see if anybody else would like to have a question or a comment. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Raquel, and I was really interested in the part where you spoke about um, uh, some of the sermons starting off in Arabic, kind of following those patterns and then switching into the local language. Did you find when you were looking at these local language sermons that they kind of followed the same pattern anyways, even though they were, you know, in the local language versus in the traditional Arabic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, for the most part. But also there are so many differences, right? Just depending on which country you're talking about, which time and place and what the circumstances are. Um, but all of them talk about taqwa and I mean, and, and cite Quran and hadith and, and good deeds and all of those things. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? Or questions? Dr. Sarah Risha, any comment? No, I'm good. I'm still feeling the words that when she explained about, you know, having the khutbah and the scary things they're saying about people, other cultures and other yeah. beliefs. It is really scary to announce this and just sit and teach people this stuff. I'm glad we're not living in these situations. <laughs> and okay. thank you, you did a very good job. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sara Risha is uh, one of our principal lecturers in Arabic studies at the SU. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite our students as well, if you have any, any questions. Please, if you have any questions of any kind, uh, I, mean, I would be delighted to to respond or just to hear your thoughts on any of these topics. Sure. So please go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. Professor Abdullah Galab. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. My microphone is muted. No, 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 you're now, you are unmuted now. Go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Professor uh, Tahra. It's a nice, nice to see you after this long time. Uh, I think uh, thanks for uh, Dr. Ali for making this opportunity. Uh, although uh, we noticed that the end of the 20th century uh, was the end of an old phenomena, which was Nazism, was it the ism that I call, Nazism, uh, fascism, colonialism, and Islamism. Mm -hmm. And uh, a new phenomena started uh, to grow by the beginning of the 21st century, which is the Salafism, the Salafism or Salafi Islam, which is spreading in the Middle East, West Africa, for the Boko Haram and the Izala, and um, and former Soviet Soviet states and other parts of the world, even in Europe. Of course, there is politics behind the spread of this phenomenon. The uh, the ceremonies of the Salafi Imams are very toxic. Yeah. And I wonder if you can, uh, I'm sorry to say that, if you could give some kind of an explanation for this 21st century phenomenon. I mean, I agree that some of these sermons are very toxic. 
And I agree that Salafism is spreading. And I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, I repeat what I said. I agree that some of these sermons are very toxic. I also agree that, you know, Salafism is spreading through madrasas and through various means in many parts of the world. And it's in many cases, it's promoting a very intolerant ideology. And one of the ways in which it does so is through these public sermons, really. Uh, Salafis are non I mean, many kinds of people use the Friday sermon, the pulpit, to promote all kinds of things that are not good, that are actually quite against the spirit of Islam. So um, I, 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 I don't think that it has anything to do with the sermon itself or the, you know, the fact that it's a Friday sermon. It's that just these people have these particular agendas and they're using whatever means that are effective, right? I mean, so the fact that they can use, they, they can claim the authority of the prophet to say things like go out and kill them or something like that. I mean, it's just horrific, really. I mean, it, it's, um, it, it, it's, so it's not the sermon itself, the sermon itself, the, the exemplar is the prophet and the earliest sermons by Muhammad and by Adi, as we have seen, are completely focused on being good people and kind of, and being introspective in terms of thinking of what we are, why we're here, you know, our relationship with God, our relationship with all of God's creatures, and promotes peace and 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 and, and compassion and kindness and affection. Um, the folks who are using the puppet for the opposite um, effect are, you know, that they're. I mean, they're not following the example of the prophet. They're not following the son of the prophet. What can one say? I think it's important for people to be aware, generally. Uh, that sermons, you know, someone, anyone who gets up on the pulpit is not necessarily wearing the mantle of the prophet. And they may, if they're following the sunnah, then they are. And if they're not, then they're not. So we need to be source critical in terms of, it's not whoever just wears a, an imama, you know, is, is not necessarily speaking truth. We have to judge people by what they say. And if it's according to the prophet to the quran and the sunnah then it's good uh, as a muslim i would say that and if it's if it goes against the precepts um that are preached in, by the the quran and the sunnah then then muslims should not accept them thank you very much indeed um anybody else would like to uh, um Can I suggest? Um, we have our uh, Fulbright uh, FLTA, uh, Romesa Yusel from Turkey. I'd like to invite to Romesa if she would like to ask a question or... Um, Romesa, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for enriching uh, talking. Actually, I have no idea about the, this uh, kind of information. So it's a brand new field for me and it's so informative. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Romaisa is teaching Turkish for us this semester as a Fulbright uh, fellow. Thank you, Romaisa. Um, anybody else would like to, to or has a comment? Nicole, would you like to make a comment or if you have a question? One of my graduate students, Nicole. So Dr. Asoad is putting everybody on the spot. <laughs> Be prepared. She is no, only, only, if, <laughs> um, only if they no, want to, or any of uh, our it, It's team. nice. So uh, just so you all know, you know, it's really nice for me to hear your voices and to kind of hear your little bit of your thoughts. You know, it gives me a sense of community. I've just been speaking to myself mostly through this last hour. So it's wonderful if you can if, if uh, a few people can speak, but thank you for all of those who have, and thank you for all who haven't also, but have attended. Yes. So Nicole, the floor is yours. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you. I don't have any questions right now. I, I just really appreciated the 
the lecture. Thank you so much. You're most yeah. welcome. So inviting everybody just to unmute if you would like to say anything, um, Ashley or anybody, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for the talk. I really, uh, I found it very insightful. Um, I've noticed I've gone through different mosques in the area and they all do sermons differently. So I found it very interesting. I've gone to the Bosnian Masjid. It's I grew uh, up going. Abdul Razak? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Abdul Razak, Abdul Rahman. I'm yes. originally from Ethiopia. I, okay. I uh, graduated from ASU and I kind of work at Mayo Clinic. But uh, I live in the valley and I've noticed different masajid have different ways of doing the sermon you know it's, so it's interesting when you see there's like you said there's this ritual um i've been to like the somali masjid where the khutbah is in arabic and majority of the people don't speak arabic at all the kids mm -hmm. definitely don't speak arabic mm -hmm. and even if they did it in somali the kids don't speak somali so mm -hmm. sort of like the benefit of what you should get out of the juma and the khutbah is like you know, it's it's very sorely lacking in a lot of spaces. Um, and some people just do it sort of, if you go to the Bosnian masjid, it's done in Bosnian, right? So that makes sense. The majority of the attendees are Bosnian. But when I go, I sort of get like, you know, bits and pieces when I hear Arabic. You know, I understand the, the Arabic. Um, but just interesting, because a lot of what you said really kind of fit with what I've seen in the valley. And um yeah. yeah thank you for that yeah no thank you for your your your, your observation um and you know it, it's interesting because so many there's so much fit kind of that goes into this question right of of of, of um can the sermon be in any other language than arabic so the people there's so much ink that has been spilt on this question uh, through the ages in different madhab in different denominations of Islam have argued about this. Um, and so, for example, there are some denominations which believe that the two khutbahs, the two-part khutbah of the Juma and the Eid is actually in lieu of the two rakahs, the two cycles of the ritual prayer, of the zohr, of the known prayer, right? So you pray two cycles for the Juma, for the Friday prayer, and then the two-part khutbah is part of that. And that's why they say you're not supposed to speak during the khutbah because it would like you're not speak, supposed to speak during the, the prayer because it would break your, I mean, all of these are later developments. It's it's very interesting. I mean, this, this kind of discussion is later development. In fact, in the early Friday sermon, if, which was all of the orations were very interactive in the earliest period of the prophet and, and, and soon after him, where people asked questions during the Friday sermons or said things. And, you know, there was a kind of, back and forth to it as well. But then coming back to this issue of language, you know, because some folks believe that this is part of the prayer and in the actual ritual prayer, the Salat, you're only supposed to use Arabic. Again, that is a question that has been resolved. What parts of it can you use other languages in and so on? But so there are several, several denominations which only allow Arabic in the uh, in the khutbah as well, even though most people can't understand. I mean, I grew up in India and most people don't understand Arabic there. Um, but there they kind of then make up for it by, I mean, I, I interviewed folks who went to the mosque in India. In Sunni mosques in India, the women are not allowed. So that's yet a whole different story. But so I interviewed men who, so I wasn't able to go myself to, to kind of observe but the i interviewed some men and you know they said well i he, who didn't understand any arabic and who don't know arabic and they said well i sort of follow i go regularly so i can sort of follow what's being said because it's the same prayers and rituals and names that are being mentioned so if the preacher did something very different then people would know that i mean so they get a sense of what's being said said versus the actual thing and then the sermon, which is very short, because for, because it's a prayer and no one really understands, so it's about 10 minutes or so. Again, this I'm talking about certain places in India. And then it's followed by a lecture in the local language, which kind of expounds on the themes that are going to be in the sermon itself. But that's the actual preaching versus the first part, which is the formal sermon 
in India, which is in Arabic, is purely liturgical. And it has no, it has no political content also, but it also is not understood. I mean, it has no meaning in terms of counseling people to do anything because they're not understanding. So it's purely seen as baraka, as kind of important to participate because it's a form of worship. Um, but it's interesting. Right? It's really interesting and see differences and different discussions and what's allowed and what's not allowed and and which which languages and in which parts and and so on. Right? In Turkey, also, it used to be all in in Arabic until the at the Turk in, in the Republic. This you know the Turkish mosques now have uh, the khutbah itself in Turkish, except for the tahmid in the praise formula which is in arabic but it didn't used to be like that uh, a while back thank you very much indeed i um, um yeah i noticed that in arizona in some of the mosques in arizona they do the khutbah in arabic and then they follow it with another khutbah in english so mm -hmm. you know and i think i thought that was fair to those who do not speak english and as, as Abu Razak said, most of the, the, the younger, um, they, they just understand it better if it's, even if they spoke a local language, um, yeah. the Arabic dialect, they, they understand English better than they understand other, other languages, uh, you know, yeah. yes. I mean, the point is the meaning, right? I mean, if you don't understand it, what's the point? So it's really important to speak in the language of the people. We yeah. sent every messenger that we sent with the, in the tongue of, with the tongue of the people. And that means, I think, a language, but it also means being attuned to the reality of today, of the present day, to understand your congregation. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not just that I can speak English, I know English, but you need to know the culture and you need to know your people and you need to speak in a, in an idiom in that sense, that people can resonate and, and yeah. that speaks to them and that speaks to their issues versus talking about things that, you know, they, many people just don't care about. So you need to speak about ethics. Ethics is important, was important then and it's important now. And you also may need to talk about things that are, you know, relevant to the present day and age, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Qutbuddin, um, you know, one of the most beautiful things that, you know, we hear about, you know, some of the Prophet's sermons and Qutbut al and other sermons, when he spoke about women, and not only in sermons, but also in hadith narratives, uh, you know, addressing people to, to take care of women. And um, mm -hmm. so, it is very sad to see, you know, what is happening against women in Muslim communities within that. And, and, and people do not, not only follow their religion, they don't even know about what the Prophet said in that regard. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there are many, many Muslim women and many communities in which women actually have a very strong voice and a very happy life and others where it, that is not the case. And Muslims really, need to step up and not only talk about other people seeing them in a certain way but i mean that also is islamophobia is a terrible thing so i think that just there are all sorts there are many so many aspects to these issues i think and everyone needs to step up and take responsibility yeah well we're doing our best i mean i teach a class that i have been teaching you know for so many years the quran text and women and i teach women in Islam from the perspective of the Quran particularly, you know, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's amazing to see what the Quran says that has been neglected, um, yeah. not only by the claim Western media, but by Muslims themselves. Yeah. yeah, and you know, the example that I gave that in India, Sunni mosques do not allow uh, women, you know, I, I mean, why not, right? In the time of the Prophet, women attended Mosque. In the mosque, they were present at the in the sermons. They were present. Women asked questions in the sermon, so we have this, you know, record in the historical record and the texts. And yes, there are important issues of modesty and and so on, and those can be maintained. But why, you know? And spiritually, men and women are considered equal in the Quran. I gave actually a talk on women in Islam at DYU. Uh, 
many years ago. The conference, now, yeah. Young University in Provo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talked about this spiritual equality of women in, in the Quran. Um, whoever among you, male or female, if you do good, then you will go to paradise. So, yeah. So it's it's there's no differentiation in terms of spiritual value between men and and women and absolutely and even even the the the, the creation I mean the verse on creation I mean there's no distinction at all I mean mentioning BYU and um, Utah I'd like to you know just mention to everybody that. The first time I know uh, Professor Qutbuddin was that she was my professor at the University of Utah when I was doing my PhD. And so as I'm very proud to have her again today here. And, um, and so it's, you know, when, when, when Muslims uh, speak, you know, without any knowledge about women in Islam, they, do, they even don't know that there is a whole chapter, chapter 58, Al-Mujadila, she who pleads. She who argues in the Quran, that's in the Quran that, you know, those people are very oblivious to. And it's really very sad. It takes education to, like Professor Qutbuddin said, you know, we should do our best to yeah. learn. So the hadith of the Prophet, seeking knowledge is mandatory for each Muslim man and Muslim woman. It's not allowed, it's mandatory. Exactly. And education is really important for everybody. Yeah, and yeah. there are many good things, and so it's not that all societies are to, you know, it, 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 they mistreat women, that's not the case at all, but there are many societies and many individuals where... Yes, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. yeah, well, in the remaining four, four minutes, uh, I'd like, in addition to thanking Dr. Qutbuddin very much indeed for this wonderful and in-depth uh, presentation and uh, uh, lecture, I'd like to just uh, say a few words about the Council, that the Council for Arabic and Islamic Studies was established at Arizona State University to acknowledge the significant contributions of Arabic studies and Islamic civilization and cultures to the world at large, both historically and in the modern age. The Council's research and teaching programs seek to promote multiculturalism, diversity, interfaith dialogue, cross-cultural understanding, and the expansion of human civilization and cultures through Arabic, as well as other Middle Eastern uh, languages, including Persian and Turkish. And the Council seeks to develop constructive academic and cultural interaction and partnerships between ASU and uh, similar groups in the Arab and Muslim orders at large. My conviction has always been literature is often conceived as a cultural tool towards greater human understanding. The more we study others' literary arts, cultures, and civilizations, the better enabled to become, we, we become to achieve understanding and to work toward world peace, hopefully. You know, and um, at this point, I'd like to thank everybody, and I'd like to thank, in particular, Professor Tahir Qutbuddin, our distinguished speaker today, for this wonderful opportunity. And thank you so much. And um, Prof Professor Qutbuddin, I give you uh, the last word here. Thank you very much, Dr. S Dr. Sohad Ali, and all of you who attended and participated. And uh, in this um, fall, e nice fall evening. Thank you very Sad, much. I have a question. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Y do you have a question uh, again? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Professor Gilab, go ahead. Uh, one of the new and interesting phenomena uh, now is the uh, so Muslim women mosques. Yes. Um, not only in the United States, in the United States, in different cities of the United States, in Asia, Indonesia in particular, and in China. Yes. Uh, could you please just give some kind of a brief uh, explanation to that, Dr. Tahara? Um, yep. Sure, I, I can, you know, I, again, this is not my area of research, but I can share a personal anecdote, anecdote with you. So I went to um, 
for my undergraduate studies. I live, I mean, I grew up in India, then I went to Egypt, to Cairo to learn Arabic. So I entered Ain Shams University, Kuliat al Banat, in the Department of Arabic Language and, and Literature. And it was a women's faculty. So it was, I'm mean, not faculty, I, I don't want to call it Kuliat al Banat, the women's uh, only yeah. college. Um, and we had a mosque in the, in, on the campus, on, on the grounds, and that we all prayed in, in you know, du during uh, the day when we were on campus. So it was really, it was very nice. It was my first time uh, being in a women's only mosque. So in India, I had attended, I all my life attended mosques, which were mixed. In my community, there are separated sections for men and women. But uh, this was a really, I, I think it's a, it's a nice phenomenon. In Egypt also, I experienced, in addition to, you know, women's mosques, uh, women's groups meetings meeting in in mosques for kind of religious uh, discussions and so on and it was a very nice really very nice space for for women to get together and uh, yeah and and I think uh, uh, Professor Gallard who is by the way a professor of uh, uh, religious studies and Islamic studies and African African studies at ASU um, uh, he was chair and I was on a member of a committee of one of our students who did her dissertation on uh, uh, women's mosques in Indonesia. And it was, uh, you know, uh, Bethany Elias, it was about three, four years ago. It was a, a very wonderful experience to, uh, to learn more about, you know, those kind of mosques, women's mosques. Now, there are two comments, uh, Dr. Tahira. Uh, Nicole said she remembered when you spoke at, you know, at BYU, and uh, she also is a graduate of BYU. And uh, Abdul Razak said that he attended the mosque um, uh, in Chicago where women were not allowed to speak. We're not, uh, Abdul Razak, we're not allowed to speak or we're not allowed to pray in the mosque. Well so me and my wife went um but uh so we went in and um i i couldn't find a woman's entrance so we ended up going in but they uh it was awkward from the beginning they tried to basically shove us into a closet and uh basically they said if the men find out there's a female here they would go crazy so i kind of sense we were in the wrong place wrong time so i have to sort of search for another message that was yeah, this is like one of those like it was just an all Daisy community, and so uh, quickly search. I mainly went to visit my aunt's grave, and so I was looking for a quick jama, but uh, I ended up going to the wrong place. And uh, me and my wife never felt so um, I don't know, just so weird and so um, unwelcomed. So uh, there's different communities, and it's just it's just interesting to see how people sort of transport their culture here and try to create the same thing they had back home or something. Um, but yeah, there's there's different examples of that in the US and everywhere else in the world. Just It's just interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah thank you for sharing. And let's hope for a better time. Yes. Okay, at this point, thank you very much indeed. We've had a very excellent event today. And I'd like to uh, also mention that this um, uh, event has been, uh, as uh, Dr. Tahir Qudubi mentioned at the beginning, part of the Humanities Week. The Humanities Week began today, you know, sponsored by the Dean of Humanities, um, uh, Professor uh, Dean uh, Jeffrey Cohen. And uh, it goes until, until Thursday and Friday. So I'd like to encourage all of you to please participate in all the events. They're all um, ACU events. Um, but as far as the council, our next event is after the Humanities Week. It's going to be on November 2nd. Uh, it's a film viewing and documentary about uh, the Kingdom of Morocco. And on the 17th of um, November, we, had another, we have another um, poetry series, Contemporary and Modern Arabic poetry. So please come to those events. And with this, thank you very much indeed, Professor Khutbuddin. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. And we hope to see you sometime at some other time soon. And we hope to, to host Dr. Khutbuddin in person next time, inshallah. Oh, I would love to come. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye-bye.